slipped by. I didn't realize it was already 6.05. Um, we are uh, in the same boat we were last Sunday night. The kids are, uh, the, um, the girls have, are still helping milk every day, and uh, they had new problems today that they had not had before, apparently. So they're coming, but they're running behind. Um, let's, uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for our, um, the opportunity we have together here this evening. I pray that you would speak um, through uh, my words, through your word, that you would teach us, that we would grow closer to you. Lord, may your name be exalted and lifted up. Thank you for, um, for all that you've given us. Lord, we are so blessed. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Start tonight with 483 in your hymn books, number 483, Footsteps of Jesus. Let's all stand and sing.
Just so we're all ready, at the end of the service, we've got one more song we're going to sing. Um, and, uh, but uh, Jana requested that we wait for Lydia to get here to play it. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I, would, uh, I really do appreciate um, how much y'all have told us you're praying for us, and I know that you are. Um, we are definitely um, 
The church is never very far from my mind. Let me say it that way. As far as um, you as, as, as our friends, um, as our family, um, and, um, and even what the future holds and what that looks like and what things are going to look like. Um, I would appreciate continuing to pray for Jana. We, we had a, um, a wonderful beginning of the week. So we listed the house last Sunday, and we had seven viewings by Thursday, which is crazy. It's not even the weekend. And then kind of crickets over the weekend, which kind of surprised us. And I say that. I don't know. You, you ladies probably can relate better than, than I can for sure. This business of being at any point 30 minutes away for someone to come tour your house is exhausting for Jana. <laughs> So continue to pray for her about that. And then this is the second Sunday in a row. It is not her favorite thing to come and, uh, and play. And she's happy to do it. And I'm, I always think she does a wonderful job. But um, it, is, uh, it is not her favorite thing in the world um, to, to uh, get to be surprised. And, and anyway, um, pray, pray for her. Um, if you will, turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 2 this evening. We're going to be continuing walking through the book. I, I intend to spend two weeks on chapter 2, but rather than looking at the first half this week and the second half next week, what I'm going to do is look at both halves both weeks. And the reason I'm going to do that is because as I was praying about how to talk about this, there's two clear distinctions I want to make. And so what I plan to do this evening is we're going to look at chapter 2, um, first with the idea of how to identify someone, and then next week when we look at it, we're going to be looking at it with the idea of um, what is the result of their teaching. And what I'm talking about here in chapter 2 in 2 Peter are false teachers. Um, it is not an accident. I didn't come to Second Peter as an accidental thing to be the last major book that we're able to go through together. Um, and so it might surprise you that um, there's so much emphasis on uh, being concerned, but it shouldn't surprise you. Paul was actually really clear in the same way. If you remember the passage of Scripture that Johnny read, when he talked about the Ephesian elders, they came out and they met with Paul for the very last time. They came to the beach to listen. And what um, Paul said is, I am warning you that false teachers will come. And so it seems as if every time Paul finished his teaching, he made it a point to say, now I've, I've, I've taken you to this place, now beware of those that might will come later. Peter does the same thing. And so this book, in many ways, is Peter's last remarks, definitely his last remarks as recorded to the church. And he has just got finished saying at the end of chapter 1 that um, prophecy doesn't happen on its own. People don't just make it up off the top of their heads. He said, we were an eyewitnesses of the gospel. We saw it. We didn't come up with clever myths. It was something that we are witnesses of the truth. And he says, I'll read it for you. <clears throat> no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Then he says, in contrast to that, what well, we're going to begin reading tonight in chapter 2. But false prophets also arose among the people. Just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresy, heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. What I want to do this evening is we're, we're, we'll go quickly, but I want to present nine um, signs of a false teacher. Before I do that, just let me mention what Peter does is very instructive for us, even in what we are supposed to be doing with Scripture. Verse 1 tells us false teachers also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. What he does is he says, understand the past and what has happened historically so that you can understand what is happening in your life. When we take these application points, 
So for instance, we've been going through 1 Samuel. We've been reading about the life of David. And one of our jobs as people coming honestly to Scripture is we read what happens in his life. And he says, and we have to say, as it happened in David's life, so it'll happen in our life. Not that we'll have to throw a stone at a giant. But that there will be people who stand up and defy the living God. And working against them will take an act of faith. And our lives will be in our hands. And God is the one who has to protect us and hold us. And Peter does that for us. He teaches us that that's what we're supposed to do. What he says is, you look at the prophecies of the Old Testament and you realize Isaiah didn't make this stuff up. He was given this word by the Spirit, carried along by the Spirit to give it to him. And then he says, oh and by the way, In the days of Isaiah, there were false prophets. I was looking at the last time I taught this, and I taught this as as a Sunday school class, and in my daily readings at that time, so years ago, apparently I was reading Jeremiah. And I was reading about false prophets in Jeremiah. Sure enough, here comes the prophet of the Lord, and also at the same time, there are false prophets who claim to be from the Lord, but are not. And in my notes, I said, it was interesting to me, reading in Jeremiah, do you know how to, where to find the false prophets? And that's the first point I want to make this evening, the first point I think that Peter makes. He says, if you're going to look for false prophets, where are they going to be found? In Jeremiah's day, they were in the temple. And what he says is that there will be false prophets prophets among the people and there will be false prophets among you that is really hard it's hard for me to look at our congregation and say beware there could be false prophets that rise up even here man that would that is a hard thing to say and believe me if i was talking about an individual (laughs) who You would know it. (laughs) But I say it confidently because that is exactly what Paul said too. And it's also what Jesus said. There would be wolves. Where will the wolves be? Among the sheep. Not on the outside, but on the inside. Man, it terrifies me. And it's not as if these were like these gigantic congregations of thousands and thousands of people. I think when Paul was talking to the Ephesians, he was not looking at a large hundreds of people, the elders that came that day. And he said, even then, false prophets will rise among you. What it means, I think, is that we don't let our guard down. You can't say, well, he's one of us, therefore, all's well. I wish we could, but I don't think we have that. (laughs) We can't do that in Scripture. Now, I will also say that I have been in congregations, not here, but I've been in congregations where the term heresy and the term false prophet seemed like they could come out of anyone's mouth at any point in time about anyone. There was almost like this contentiousness. In other words, I think all the sheep treated all the other sheep as if they might be wolves at any second. It was not a very united place. And that also is dangerous. And so there is a word of caution. And I will not back down from saying that the false prophets might be among us. And therefore you need to be careful. But I do think that we are given clear things to look for so that we don't have to live in constant fear. So the first one, they are among us. The second one is that they teach heresies. There will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. I'll go ahead and tell you so you'll have it for next week. This week I'm talking about false teachers, their traits, and next week I'll talk about false teachers and their fate. So we'll come back to all of these passages that as we're reading along here, their destruction is near, they will be destroyed. You can be assured that they will be destroyed. And I'll talk more about that next week. But this evening I want to especially look at their traits. We know that they'll be among us, number one. And number two, that they will teach heresies. What does a false teacher look like? Well, they teach. (laughs) That's probably obvious. 
But if you notice, that there are some things that, that Peter has to say about the type of things they teach. First off, the things they teach are destructive. They are practically bad. Also, they are secretive. Beware of someone who wants to constantly be having secret conversations. And thirdly, they deny, the way Peter says it, denying the master who bought them. The way I'm going to say it is denying God. And I think in three different ways, as you would expect. How do they deny God? Well, I think they can deny what Peter says here is the master. Something David said this morning that I think is really true. One of the signs of being a Christian is following Christ. You are not a Christian if you don't follow Christ. Denying the master, I think there is something specially about denying the lordship of Jesus. I understand the definition of a heresy is having failed in an understanding of who Jesus is. Now, I might could be convinced to expand that to having failed in understanding in who God is. But I think we need to make sure that word needs to be reserved for talking about failing to understand God. Not about eschatology, not about creation, not about all kinds of doctrines that I think are essential. Important enough that I would break fellowship. There are lots of people out there that I don't think that I could go to church and sit under their preaching, and yet I don't think that they're a heretic. Does that make sense? That word is reserved specifically for those who in some way or form or fashion deny God. Now, this says deny the master. I'm going to add to that and say that if you're denying Jesus, you are also denying the Spirit. And I'll say that in Matthew chapter 12, verse 30, Jesus says, Whoever is not with me is against me, and who does not, whoever does not gather with me scatters. Therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be, given, will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Let me tell you, as you read through 2 Peter chapter 2, there is no question that the false prophets are in that category of condemned people. And as such, they are denying their master, the master, it's not their master, but they are also denying the Spirit. And I think we see evidence of this when, Peter, when Jesus says that. That I speak what the Spirit tells me. And if you're denying my words, you're denying the Spirit's words. And that will not be forgiven you. Also, in keeping in that is also a connection to God himself, to the Father. In Luke chapter 10, verse 16, the one who hears you hears me, and the one who rejects you rejects me, and the one who rejects me rejects him who sent me. So when Peter says here that the false teachers deny the master, I'm saying if you deny Jesus, you are also denying the Spirit, and if you deny Jesus, you are also denying the Father. We talk about Judeo-Christian values. And I don't know if you've ever had friends who are Muslim. I have. And I can tell you that in a lot of ways, we agree on a lot of things. We agree, for instance, on the creation of the world, that God is in charge, that He's the one who made everything. We agree on what righteous living looks like, largely. There's some differences. But immorality is bad. The Ten Commandments. No graven images. But you know what? I don't consider people who are Muslims to be my brothers or even those who are Jewish to be my brothers outside of Christ because when they denied Christ, they have also denied the Father as well. You can't just say, well, you know, we're kind of the same. Well, yeah, there's some similarities, but we are not the same. 
It's the same thing that I would say about Jehovah's Witness. If you don't think that Jesus is God in the flesh, then we don't have much in common because our hope is entirely built on the Master. They teach heresies. Thirdly, they encourage sensuality. Verse 2, many will follow their sensuality and because of them the way of the truth will be blasphemed. We talk about encouraging sensuality. There's a couple of things you'll notice. Number one is they'll draw a crowd. I'm so thankful for our church. I, this is not something I've ever even commented on. In January, there was a particular Sunday night that is probably when there used to be Sunday night church was the least attended Sunday night ever. Anyone know what night that is? It's in January. What's that? It's the night of the Super Bowl. And I'm old enough to remember when those debate. there's no debate anymore. When there was a debate about do you cancel church so you can watch a football game? We never even had a conversation about that here. And I appreciate that. There's, why would you even, no, why would you think that? I remember listening, this is years ago, to a conversation about that. And it went something like, you know what, think of all the people that will come. And someone, I won't say who it was, said, well, you know, a lot more will come if you serve beer at halftime. Where's your line? What are you going to do to bring people in? And I'll tell you, and I'm saying that to say, and I'm not saying that people who stay home on the Super Bowl are false prophets. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that those who encourage sensuality will draw a crowd. When you encourage sin, you will draw a crowd. Does that mean all crowds are doing that? No. Jesus said, fed 5,000 who had traveled for days without food to hear him speak. He had a huge crowd, and it was not sensuality that drew them, it was the word of God. But even then, when he left the next day, and they came around and found him, and they said, teacher, where did you go? He said, you're seeking me because I filled your bellies. He actually warned them of the opportunity, even now, to go running after sensuality. It is an easy temptation to fall into. And what false teachers do is they present sensuality as something, and therefore they'll have a crowd. And so because of that, the way will be blasphemed. Really appreciate that description of Christianity. There are several places in Scripture where it is described, what it is that we believe is described as not our belief, but as the way, the way to walk. Again, the understanding is you follow Christ. He has shown us the way, and He is the way, and therefore we follow the way. And what Peter says is these come, and when they preach this sensuality, the way will be blasphemed. And I think there's two, way, two ways in which the way is blasphemed. One is, it took me a long time to say it so I didn't confuse myself, so I'm going to read it the way I said it. People think less of Christ because of the actions of false teachers. I don't know if you've had those conversations. I've had many conversations with, with people say, I don't understand why a church is able to be a tax-free club. What do they mean? Well, you seek your own sensualities. You can do whatever it is you want. And you just get to do it without having to pay taxes. Why? Because they apparently have gone to churches where the purpose of gathering money at the church was not to serve the, the world, serve God, but instead to collect or do whatever other things that were done. And so the way has been blasphemed because people said they followed Christ but their actions didn't demonstrate it, and the world has misunderstood what it means to follow Christ because of that. That's one way. The other way is by listening to their teachings. 
The other way, the way is blasphemed, is people are taught this is what Jesus says we ought to do. So I'm thinking in my mind of two groups of people, some who are outside the church who look at the false teachers and say, if that's what the church looks like, that's wrong and I won't follow it. And they blaspheme the name of God because of a false presentation of who God is. The other group of people I'm thinking of are those who are in the church, who are misled because of the teachings. And so they begin to think that sensuality is okay. And in either case, the way is blasphemed. They encourage sensuality as the third. The fourth one is they will be greedy. Be warned of teachers who are seeking after money. Now, I will also say, and again, I am. (laughs) This is wonderful to be able to talk to a church who has lived this out so well. Y'all are a model of what churches ought to be like, where your generosity, where I get calls after a pastor has come and spoken and say, "There's been a mistake." The check was too high. (laughs) Praise God for the generosity of a church in that regard. That you have taken it to heart to show special respect for those who are in leadership. This is not a, a, a verse that says that we ought to be stingy. But on the flip side, be concerned about someone whose concern is money. Verse 3, and in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. That's what we need to be concerned about. So four that we got from these three verses. They are among you. They teach heresies. They encourage sensuality. And they will be greedy. Let's continue as we, as we look at the characteristics of false teachers. Let's keep reading in verse 4. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others, When he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day by day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. And especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. Whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. So in this, we see two other points. And again, I'm going to be skipping over in some ways a lot of verses here. Next week, when I talk about the fate of false prophets, we'll look at these examples. We have Noah, we have Sodom and Gomorrah, and we have uh, and, and Lot in that city. And we're going to have a third one. We'll have Balaam before we're all said and done. And we'll come back and look at the, those three next week. But now, what we're doing is we're tracing the, the traits of the false teachers. And in, in verses 4 through 11, what we see in verse 10 is that they, are, that they divulge in lustful passion. And notice what that does. It defiles them. Beware of those who divulge in lustful passion. By the way, passion, when we hear the word lustful, our minds immediately go into certain channels, and as they, that is what that word is referring to, but not only that way. There are all kinds of things that you can lust after besides sexual sin. Be careful for those who have no control over their passions and are constantly being driven by. Their passions. 
Jesus said, by their fruit you will recognize. It matters. Some of you, I think, yeah. As you are on the search team and you're considering pastors, I've been on a search team. One of my great sadnesses was the week I realized no one is going to write, I follow my passions in their resume. That is not something that is easy to see. That takes actually getting to know someone. Looking at their family. I think that's why the Bible tells us to look at their family. To try to understand, are they governed by their passions? Do they indulge in passions? Okay. And then, sixth, we're doing well. They despise authority. Verse 10, they, especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. What does that look like? Well, bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. Here are some characteristics of someone who defies authority. Number one, a boldness. Number two, a willfulness. Now, if you remember, Paul prayed, pray that I will, he asked the, the, um, the believers in Ephesus to pray that I would speak boldly as I ought. I've always enjoyed reading that because I can't think of someone more bold than Paul. He is, in my mind, the definition of the person who walks into the charged Sanhedrin, stands up in front of them, and as we read in our reading just recently, I think it might have been this morning, looks at them all and says, I'm here on account of a resurrection, and he stops back and watches them fight. (laughs) He is a man who goes boldly into places and says bold things, knowing he's the only one that I've ever heard of that was stoned, and getting himself up, he went back into the city. (laughs) And yet he prayed for boldness. So on one hand, there is a boldness, but Paul's boldness is a boldness that stood not in his own willfulness, but only in the strength of the gospel. What he was bold to say is that Jesus rose from the dead. And that you must accept him to be saved. What we see in those who despise authority is a different type of boldness. A willfulness. A strong-headedness, I think. So they're bold, they're willful. And then this interesting thing that they're even willing to blaspheme angels willing to say things that they have no business saying. And I should be clear, what it says, they blaspheme the glorious ones. The reason I think that's the angels is because if you keep reading in verse 11, I think he contrasts the glorious ones. He says, whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. So I think what he's doing, what Peter's saying is that these false prophets are willing to blaspheme the angels. But the angels are much stronger, but they're not willing to, blas- to speak words against the false prophets. Again, these are things to be warned of. Beware of someone who defies authority. By the way, in all that I say, it's so easy to start really pointing and one of the things I hope this helps us do is to say, I want to make sure I eliminate any hint of false teacherness in my life. That's one of my great prayers as someone who stands up in front of you to teach and preach that I would not be guilty of chasing after sensuality or lusts or passions that I would be careful 
and what I have to say about things I don't understand. And I would ask you to, that you sh- or I would tell you, you need to do the same. Be careful about speaking what you don't know. Be careful about despising authority. Let's keep reading in verse 12. <clears throat> But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as they wage, uh, as the wage for their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revile in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children. Forsaking the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, um, I'm sorry, forsaking the right way they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and constrained the prophet's madness. What we see here is, number one, they are irrational. This is number seven. They are irrational. I um, recently took a biblical um, philosophy class, or I audited it, I listened to it. And as I was doing that, um, something that was really interesting to me about the, the philosophers is the, the terms for uh, animal and um, uh, plants. Let's see, which one was it for plants? Oh, vegetation. If you're in a vegetative state, what does that mean? You can't move. You just stay still. If you're in... Um, uh, the, the anime spirit is, a, is the spirit of um, moving around, animation, things can move. And so you had a contrast for things that are stationary, vegetative, and things that are moving, that's like the animals. But then the philosophers made a distinction between the animals and people because people don't have to follow their instincts. They can actually go against it. We are hearing an awful lot today about living like animals. Just so you can see an example of that, it's just the way I was made. What are you saying? You can't control it? Um, I have a, a, a tradition. We live where there are flies. So in the summer, there are flies in the house. And uh, one of my jobs at night is when I lay down in bed, there's always the fly that's in the room. And that's my job. And I like that job. And you know what I do? You know what the secret? I go into the bathroom and close all the doors so it's just the bathroom space and I got my fly swatter. And I turn the lights off to every other room in the house and I crack the door. And I have never seen a fly that doesn't go to the light. And because I know they're animals, they will always respond the same way. And I can wait for them. Come into my house. (laughs) Why can I do that? Because they're animals and they follow their instincts. They make no rational decisions at all. And dogs are the same way. As cute and lovable and as human-ish as they can act sometimes, dogs and cats are not people too. (laughs) They're animals. And they act like animals. And we are not animals. (laughs) We are distinctly different from that. We don't have to be driven by instinct. And what, Paul, what Peter says here is no compliment. They can't help it. They're driven by their instincts. They're like they were born to be caught and destroyed. There is no decision that they make. Instead, they just act because of their instinct. Number eight, they are never satisfied with sin. 
I want you to notice what this looks like. There was, I didn't know what to do with this when I first came across it because it was a list that we really had already been given. Verse 14, they have eyes full of adultery, insatiable sin, for sin. And then it says, um, well, that, that actually that follows. This description of, of all of the things that they do. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed. Accursed children, forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. So you read about their adultery, about all of these things. Again, we've already talked about that. And then I understood that what he was getting at is that they, have an, they are absolutely insatiable desire for sin. They cannot be satisfied. And so it says they have adulterous eyes, always looking for the next thing. And what are they looking for? Unsteady souls. The next group of people to attack, entice, capture. Hearts trained in greed. The ability to look at any situation and find a greedy way of working your way out. And then maybe the thing that scares me the worst about for, on their sake, it says they're cursed. But the one that really stands out to me is uh, they're never satisfied with their sin. They know the right way and they are choosing to reject it. There's one more point I want to make and it comes from verses 17 through 19. And we'll stop there this evening. Like I said, next Sunday night, Lord willing, we'll go back through the whole chapter and we'll talk about what happens to false prophets. And then we'll talk about, in chapter 3, what we need to be like. This is not what happens to them, what I'm about to read. This is about who they are. This is their traits. Verse 17, they are waterless springs, mist driven by a storm, For them the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice the sensual passions of the flesh. Um, They entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For what overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved." False teachers, what are their traits? They're among you. They teach heresies. They encourage sensuality. They divulge in lustful passion. They despise authority. They are irrational. They are never satisfied with sin. And finally this evening, they are empty. He uses a couple of pictures here. The first one, I think the King James says, a well with no water. ESV renders it a spring with no water. What's the purpose of going to a spring? To get water. What is a waterless spring? Useless. Absolutely empty. You talk about mist driven in front of the storm. What does that look like? It ought to be rain, but it isn't. Empty clouds. Looks like it ought to be something. But when you walk into it, it doesn't do what you want it to do. False teaching has that effect. They promise freedom. But what they do is they demonstrate their own captivity. Because Peter says, for what overcomes a man is what he's enslaved to. It is so interesting. Churches that promote sensuality really harp on the freedom we have. And yet at the same time, they're reducing people back to the bondage they've been delivered from. It has become one of the most central things in my understanding of Christianity. 
not that I am saved because of what I do, but because I am saved, I desire to follow God. And I have really come to understand I look forward and glory I look forward to the glory of heaven. I look forward to the day when I'm no longer tempted by sin. And I am also very thankful that even now we have been saved from the bondage of sin. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, and it's not easy, and we fail, but through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are allowed to live in freedom in Him. And that's not freedom to sin, that's freedom from sin. And anyone who teaches anything different, Peter says, is number one, a false teacher, and number two, what they offer, what they offer you don't want. It doesn't really satisfy I should mention that they're, they're empty, but they are loud and boastful. They are empty, but they are enticing, especially to those who are weak. I'm reminded of James. If you will turn there, I didn't think of this ahead of time, but I think this is where we need to finish this evening. James chapter 5. This is how the book of James ends. He's just been talking about the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. What should we be doing with our powerful and effectiveness? Verse 19. My brothers... If anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. What do we need to be doing? Well, not false teaching. Instead, the opposite, true teaching that adheres to the commands of our Lord that follows the way, that correctly understands the submission we have in Christ. And again, not earning our salvation, but because we have saved, we, we are <laughs> gladly submitting to be the servant of God. And we find exactly the opposite of what the world would tell us, that as we become servants to God, there is freedom. And those who seek to be free in the world find themselves enslaved. False teaching, we're going to read about it again next time. It is destructive. It is condemning. It is not something. I do not want, I don't pity, I'm oh, sorry, I do pity those who are false teachers. Their destruction is coming quickly. But I think something as in the church we need to keep in mind, it is also empty My prayer for you, I hope, is your prayer for me. And it's impossible for me. I'm, I, I'm sorry. I, several of you have said, we don't go there. And I, I get that. I know we don't. <laughs> but I can't help but see that there's only a limited amount of time. It, it just It's always in front of my mind. Even if there wasn't, I would be telling you the same thing. That tomorrow you live your life to serve God for his glory. You avoid the false teachers. You chase after Christ. And my prayer is that your prayer for me is the same. That with everything in us, we live for the glory of God. And for him alone. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, it is terrifying to think about the church being ripped apart, wolves among the sheep. And yet, Lord, I'm thankful that you let us know, that you warned us so that we would be prepared, that you gave us guidance to understand, and even, Lord, that you gave us um, 
You, you, you gave us an understanding of the future so that we can have confidence. That we can live in peace even under trial. And even, Lord, that we could have compassion on those who are perishing. Help us to do that, Lord. Help us to strive to pray for each other. And Lord, where we stumble, I pray that we would reach out and help one another lead us back to the truth. If there's any here who don't know you, I pray that you would convict their hearts. And Lord, for those that do, may we live a life devoted to following you. May your name be glorified and lifted up. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing. Missed. I'll get the um, accompaniment. If y'all will come and we'll we'll sing uh, one more song this evening. Is there a word? It is going to be on the screen. Yep. Good deal. So we'll let this be our dismissing song. But let's let's sing the whole song together.